This is the Truth Network. Welcome to Running With Horses, a podcast devoted to inspire you concerning a relationship with Almighty God that empowers you to accomplish things you never thought possible. Shirley Weaver wants to take you there. And now, here's today's episode. Hey, welcome everybody. We feel we're really connected to what's going on in our world. Our title of the podcast, Running With Horses, which by the way, shares the name of our book with the same title. Just reading from that back cover. I love it. I love the whole thing. Humanly speaking, we are no match for a horse's strength or speed. But the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, and the prophet was able to outrun the king's chariots, the horses, on the long streak from Mount Carmel back to the city, which was Jezreel. And it goes on to say here, in the same way, a personal relationship with Almighty God inspires, empowers us to accomplish great exploits that, get this, we never thought possible, and, like Elijah, to deliver something of a prophetic value to the culture and the world. Running with Horses is our daily, uh, is our volume of daily writings, and this is the important part, exhorting every individual this way to expect impossible outcomes, even supernatural interventions. Inspired this way, you might say, because, inspired this way, when the pace speeds up in the sphere to which you are called, you run ahead of anything believed possible. And this last thought, like all of creation, you were born with a specific design and purpose. Yours, I'm convinced, is for this no holes barred day for this prophetic time whether in days of peace or trouble you were born for this time so that's the attitude and the premise and the whole thrust of the book and everything that's written for each day when you read that copy excuse me that from the back cover you understand it's really important for the believer not to be confused about what the will of the Lord is, not to be confused about God's will, because confusion in any setting, certainly in a spiritual context, results in delay. It's it's really a distraction. Your thoughts don't focus. Your thinking is scattered when you're not sure what it is that God wants. So Paul said to Timothy, do all the will of God. Well, if he said do all the will of God, that implies that Timothy could know the will of God, that he could perceive and understand from an understanding of the covenant that he had with the Lord, what his mission was, what his calling, what his purpose, and then the daily details of life. Listen, we are excited about what has just taken place And for those of you who are not in the United States, we have um, a really important racing event, thoroughbred racing. These are magnificent horses, God's creation. And the Kentucky Derby is the first race of what we call the Triple Crown. So it's the first race, and we go on from there for two more races to basically choose the winner of the Triple Crown. That's not something that happens very often, but the Kentucky Derby winner is always the one that sort of seizes the attention, sort of sets the pace for the rest of the racing season, leading up several weeks later to the Triple Crown. So I don't want to get off in the weeds about that, but just to kind of set the pace here, kind of let you know where we are. This week, this past weekend, was the running of the Kentucky Derby. And in the span of about two minutes, this magnificent horse named Rich Strike, rich as in wealthy, strike as in to hit. So wealthy hit, which even in calling the race, the announcer seemingly did not even 
like even acknowledge, I think about halfway through the race, race, they did mention the name Rich Strike once. So the announcers did not see, did not realize that this horse could move up for the win, possibly because they could not see. Listen, the odds on this animal to win this race was 80 to 1, 80 to 1. I'm not sure of this. I think it was, he was the least likely, the very least likely. So conventional wisdom would say for this horse, Rich Strike to win, that was not even a possibility. But when you get into watching the videos, and we'll try to put those videos in the show notes here, because I believe there is spiritual, there's a spiritual message here. I don't think we, I don't think we should miss this. I don't think we can afford to miss this because God is speaking to us through his creation. So when you think of supernatural, we said from the, from the back cover of our book, you want, you want un, unusual, unexpected outcomes. You want supernatural interventions in your life and in the mission God's called you to. And let me just tell you, about a minute and 49 seconds into the race, the jockey, let's say the one um, driving, was really boxed in. Like the horses were running so tightly together, there was no room to move forward. But if you check the video and you look at about one minute, 49 seconds, you will see that a tiny opening appeared to his right and literally, like you would steer a bicycle or an automobile, the jockey literally steered the horse with a hard right and then back left to straighten out and seize that opening. And from there, this horse looked like he had been shot from a cannon. I think of um, I think of that scripture, all creation groans. This horse appeared to have been shot from a cannon, and this was all occurring at the final turn. You know, there are four quarters in this track. This is the final quarter, the final turn, actually in the final stretch. Ten seconds later, Once the jockey made this move, at the two-minute mark, Rich Strike takes the lead, and it is the first acknowledgement by the announcer. I call the announcer the one calling the race. Think of who that would be in life, the one calling the race. And five seconds after that, he wins. Rich Strike comes from the back, least favored, all odds against him, no opening in the pack, final quarter, final turn, in the stretch, and he moves in a matter of seconds from back in the pack to take the lead for the win. You know, if you love horses, if you love the animal kingdom, and most people do have at least one member of the animal kingdom that they really love, but you know, The horse is majestic. He really is. And Job speaks to this in chapter 39, beginning in verse 19. This is a powerful passage. I think this is the NIV. Yes, the NIV. Speaking of the, the look, God is speaking. He's speaking of his creation, his animals. He's giving a portrayal to Job of his character and his power, God's character and power. He is laying it out for Job. He says this in verse 19. Did you give the horse its strength or clothe its neck with a flowing mane? Did you make it leap like a locust, striking terror with its proud snorting? It paws fiercely, rejoicing in its strength, and charges into the fray. It laughs at fear, afraid of nothing, It does not shy away from the sword. The quiver rattles against its side. 
along with the flashing spear and lance. In frenzied excitement, it eats up the ground. It cannot stand still when the trumpet sounds. It cannot stand still when the trumpet sounds. Such a powerful passage. That's verse 19 through uh, 24. Actually, 25 fits in there too. At the blast of the trumpet, it snorts. Aha! (laughs) And it catches the scent of battle. So obviously we're talking about all expressions of the way that mankind has used horses. There are many of those right there. But notice now the Lord's presence and his involvement, because in Job 38 and 39, God is laying it out there for Job. They're having a conversation. And, you know, you can hear God saying his desire is to move sovereignly in our lives, even supernaturally. And I say, because this is what I see, actually, he already is moving that way. And the reason he is moving that way is to get the attention of man. What is he saying? What is God saying in all this? I believe he is saying, look, pay attention. Uh, Pay attention. I am here. I am present. I'm here to heal this thing. I'm here to turn this thing around. Number one, I'm present, but I'm here for a purpose. I am here to advance my will, advance my kingdom. So see, it's important to not be confused about what the will of the Lord is. If God is advancing his will, advancing his kingdom, we are co-laborers with him, we are joint heirs, then it behooves us to know what that is so that we know what we're doing. We're not walking through this blindfolded. Although, you know, I know there are theologies out there sort of that point in that direction. But just think about that. Think about that. Paul said to Timothy, do all the will of God. Implied that you know what the will of God is so that you can do it. In other words, we're not puppets. Um, God is speaking to his people. He is moving through us, and we as a joint co-labor, joint heir, we understand what the will of Lord, the Lord is. Like Issachar's race in the Old Testament among the tribes of Israel, we understand what the will of the Lord is, what to do, what not to do. We discern the time. So Genesis to Revelation lays out a clear pattern of God's people grasping God's plan and then doing it. So the first example that I'm laying out for you today is this display in the Kentucky Derby in the state of Kentucky in the United States. You can see that for yourself online. A second example, one of my favorites from the Old Testament, comes out of 2 Kings chapter 6, beginning verse 15. Uh, I'll just read two or three verses here. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha, the prophet, prayed. Open his eyes, Lord, the servant's eyes, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of chariots and horses and the fire all around Elisha. The servant of the Lord, once his eyes were open, he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. In other words, initially, before he could see as the Lord sees, the servant of Elisha the prophet could only see the enemy and that there were far more of the enemy than there were were with Elisha and the servant. 
so the opposition was greater, was more populated. But the prophet said, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are against us. In other words, Elisha spoke to the unseen realm. He spoke to his sight according to faith, according to what God had revealed to him, according to what he knew was possible, according to that belief for a supernatural outcome, an expectation for divine intervention. I mean, it's right here. This is, this is clear as a bell. And Elisha prayed, You, Lord, open the eyes of the servant. Open the eyes of my servant. Think of the announcer in the race. He couldn't see the winning horse because the winning horse was so outnumbered and couldn't possibly come through to win. It wasn't possible. The odds were too great. He was outnumbered. Same scenario, basically, when you think about it. But once the Lord opened the servant's eyes, he could see the multitudes and the expanse of horses and chariots of fire. Chariots of Fire. You know, there's a movie by that name. (laughs) Chariots of Fire all around the prophet Elisha. So this is what God is saying. He is saying, I want to open your eyes so that you can see that all around you, the hills and the hillsides and all of your surroundings, everything in your sphere is charged with is supernaturally infused with my supply, my provision for you. In the case of the Kentucky Derby and the winning horse, it was the strategy of the jockey and the speed and the strength, capacity, and the destiny of that horse. Listen, these are examples for us. All of creation gives us an example, you know, um, the galaxies, uh, the mountains, the hills, the rivers, the oceans, they speak to us of the magnificence and the omnipotence of Almighty God. So we don't miss what he is saying. What is he saying? He is saying, I am present. Look, look, listen, I want to do this not only for you, but through you, with you. I'm calling you up to a higher place to be charged with the confidence of what the will of the Lord is. So what is the opposition here? What would be the detriment? What would be the reason we wouldn't see? One word, it's concealed. It's hidden. In so many ways, we're blinded. And the blinding of course, is uh, orchestrated by God's enemy, who is Satan. We are God's people. So the enemy of God moves among God's people to blind them to what it is God wants to do. Just as in the, the example of the servant of Elisha concerning the enemy army around them, How are we blinded? We're blinded by the chaos in the world around us. This produces confusion, distortion of truth. Uh, Let me say that again, distortion of truth. Actually, the inevitable consequence of sowing the wind. The more sowing the wind, the more reaping the wind. Until... We realize that, you know, it's sort of like the outrage that we should have against the distortion of truth, against confusion that steals, kills, and destroys. That's how, what the enemy comes to do. Where is the outrage against that? Where, where are the voices that would speak up who would say, you may not steal this victory from us, You may not steal this 
race from us. You may not steal this city from us, as in the case of Elisha and his servant. You may not take what God has given to us. Where is the outrage? Um, I think there's um, something written about the death of outrage, like it seems to be dead, like it's silent. So a decision has been made to accept and tolerate things that we say we firmly don't agree with, don't believe in, not our values, but there's no outrage when something comes to take that away. When we are challenged, the tendency is to shrink back, which brings into question, wouldn't you say, at the very base, at the very root, the integrity of our words, what we say we believe. Instead, there's a visceral or a, a deep inner feeling. You know, it's, it's not even, you know, rational intellectually. A visceral fear of change. A holding on to the way things are, no matter what, because we so fear the challenge of change. And we get separated from our worldview, the one that is Bible-based. And we get separated from our prophetic nature by virtue of the fact that the prophet Jesus lives on the inside of us. That prophetic nature causes us to see ahead and to anticipate what is coming and to respond with the Word of God the heart of God, the mind of God. We have the mind of Christ, therefore we have the thought life of a king, so we think in terms of uh, governing. We think in terms of saying, no, God says the government is on his shoulders. You may not take that government away from his church, away from his people, and away from the uh, environment where God has placed us, has sent us to occupy until he comes. So what is God saying? What is God saying? He's saying, don't be blinded. He's saying, where is your moral high ground? Where is it? You are built to run to win. You are built to see clearly beyond what is natural and into a spiritual perception. Where is your moral high ground? Find it. You've got to find it. You've got to find your moral high ground and other aspects of your calling and destiny because they're all there together. It's, it's grouped together. If you leave your moral high ground, then it becomes distorted what your calling, your destiny is. You lose your outrage against the things that threaten or come to steal. And you really, really cannot affect the world around you with the word of the Lord because it becomes so muddied, becomes so unclear. My question is, where is your true north? Where is your true north? What is your true north? What is what is it based on? You cannot circumvent the word of the Lord to you, not to me, not to you, when you know your true north. Of course, that is the Lord. Who is the one calling our race? The Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, their voice is in the earth, their voice is, is in the earth, and they speak this destiny clearly, this calling clearly, and they convey to us the reality every minute of every day, you were born for this time, you are wired to win, you are geared to run. You are empowered to take that moral high ground, press into your calling, press into your destiny, and do not be deceived. 
Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. What we sow, we reap. You got to stay with that moral high ground. You got to plug into that true north. And to do that, you must know what Paul said to Timothy. You must know the will of God and then do it. There's so much here. There's so much there's so much that you can't miss it. God is speaking in the earth through the animal kingdom. I once heard the expression, if you remove God from the equation, you're left with the animal kingdom. In other words, this massive majestic creature, this thoroughbred racehorse, he 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 is not like man. <laughs> Man is created in God's image, but this horse is an example to us of the goodness of God poured out in his creation when he intends to do something. When he when God intends to do something, it cannot be stopped. Not the odds ascribed by men, not the inclination or the conventional wisdom of men, not the fear of the one running the race, the jockey, the horse certainly was not afraid. Well, God said that in Job, he is not afraid. He doesn't fear the sound of battle, actually is inspired by that sound. He rises to the sound of the trumpet, rises to the sound of starting the race. So, Think about this, and don't let it escape your thinking that God is speaking to you right now. And he's speaking through the events like this, not just this one, but throughout his word, in our life, through situations, in our nation, our community, certainly in our congregations, in our churches, the Lord is saying Where is your moral high ground? What are you willing to not be outraged about? Where is your true north? Father, today we pray concerning your kingdom come and your will being done so that that is just not a scripture passage. It's not just something we recite from time to time. We really believe it. We pray concerning that, that in every aspect of what you're doing, where you are present, you are present to heal this thing. You are present to fix this thing. You are here to change lives so that destinies are ascribed. Eternity is seized and our eternal future is made possible through salvation in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray today and believe you this way and receive all of this. We receive it into our lives by faith because of your word, because of the unction and the quickening of your spirit right now telling us to do that very thing, that we do not miss what you're doing, but we see it clearly and we understand what the mind of the Lord is know what the mind of the Lord is, we do. We understand it and we know it and we move accordingly. We thank God. We thank God. We thank you, Father, that you've equipped us this way and that whether we are in days of peace or trouble, we are born for this time. We put that garment on and believe you with all our heart, all of our soul and all of our strength. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, amen and amen. God bless you today. God bless the nation where you are. He blesses you, your household, and his kingdom comes to you today, and his will is revealed to you today. Bless you. Bless you. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support this podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. 
Don't forget to check out the show notes or visit acleartrumpet.org where you can subscribe to Shirley's email list. Download the ministry app and purchase your very own copy of Shirley's 365-day devotional, Running With Horses. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.